All right, welcome everybody. We are so happy to have you join us today. As people are coming in, if you want to send us a chat of where you're coming, where you're viewing from, your year of graduation, that would be great so we can get started. And we will go ahead and get started here. So welcome, my name is Christy Fleming. I'm the Director of Alumni here at Franciscan University. And we are very excited for you to join us as we start this new year off with our Lunch and Learns. So just a reminder, we have these every single month with different topics. Um, if you are interested in a certain topic or have a suggestion, we are always uh, welcome those um, suggestions. So please let us know if you have any topics or suggestions. Uh, please remember that the chat is open, the question and answer is open, and we will leave time at the end for those. So I'm going to turn it over to Annie, who is the president of our alumni board, and she will get us started today. Thank you, Christy. Hello, everyone. I'm Annie, and I'm a 2017 uh, graduate of Franciscan. I was a philosophy major, um, now work at an app called Hallow, and I have the honor of introducing to you um, Adam, who uh, will, will be our guest today, and I'm just going to give a little quick little um, bio of him and then let him take it from there. So uh, Adam Mills is the director of brewing operations at Sonder Brewing in Mason, Ohio, a former high school teacher and university educator, and has been brewing beer professionally for over a decade. Beyond the scope of brewing, Adam specializes in staff development, leadership techniques, and training novice brewers into the trade. Adam's goal in the brewing, it, Adam's goal in the brew house is to always aim for the bullseye, knowing he will never hit it. This mantra keeps him focused on continual growth and helps his team appreciate the journey of improving as brewers. Um, thank you very much, Adam, and uh, looking forward to, to hearing more about this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, Brewing is uh, brewing's an interesting thing. Sometimes, you know, we'll see a commercial um, for for beer or for like what's happening in a brewery. And sometimes you'll see, you know, a, a bearded guy, you know, pouring malt from hand to hand or smelling hops. It, it's, it's very little of that. Uh, primarily what's done in a brewery is is manual labor. Um, and it was a, a big switch because like, as was mentioned before, the first 10 years of my working career, was in teaching. Um, so there's definitely a level of satisfaction to the fact that you're doing some manual labor. Going home physically tired is, is a little bit different than going home mentally tired. But um, but yeah, it's 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 manual labor. Uh, the super majority of what we do is clean and sanitize. Um, brewing is very much a process uh, driven industry. And we're going to walk through that today a little bit. So you should be able to see right now a, a whole bunch of uh, several bags right here. And this is we're, we're going to start with the beginning of the brewing process. And then I'm going to kind of I'm going to give you kind of a walking tour of the brewery with this vi uh, with this video. And then um, I'll pause along the way to to talk about um, what you're seeing. So really, the. Aside from water, the bulk of what goes into beer is malted barley, okay? Malted barley is simply the barley kernel that has been taken, uh, steeped in water until it wants to start growing, and then it is dried out and kilned in order to stop that growing process, right? So malted barley, once barley is malted, we have the ability as brewers to then crush it and then steep it in hot water to take the starch inside of that kernel and turn it into sugar. Sugar is ultimately what the yeast is going to end up consuming to create alcohol, CO2, and other flavors on down the line. So we actually end up making beer, right? So what you're looking at right here is, um, these are referred to as, uh, we can either get like 55 pound bags of malt or like these, uh, these super sacks of malt, which have, um, I think there's uh, maybe 2000 pounds in each one. And this is hooked up to, um, these right here are hooked up to an elevator system. 
that feeds that this is the little elevator that will feed it over to our mill room. Ultimately, what we'll see right here, there's Jeff, he does packaging for us. Ultimately, this, this, uh, this structure right here is actually the mill room. This tank right here is what's going to be holding all that crushed, all that crushed malt. So we're gonna zoom in here and take a look at our mill room. Right in the center here, the red piece of equipment is our mill. I actually think I open up the open up the curtains here. This is our mill. And so that is what's going to be crushing the barley to prepare it for the brewing process. On either side, you can kind of see uh, a bin over here. And then there is a bin on the other side as well. That's when we, we can add uh, some pre-crushed malt if we have that or some other things that won't be crushed that go into it for one of our big, uh, one of our actually our biggest selling beer, we do a hazy style IPA called You Betcha that uses oats in it. And so oats and things going on the other side and actually bypass the mill. And then we're gonna take a walk up the brew house stairs here. The brew house is actually comprised of three vessels. The middle vessel that you're going to see right here is actually the mash tun. So this is the initial vessel where everything happens with the brewing process. So you saw the tank above, up above the, uh, up above the mill room. What we'll do is we'll start that, and in that in that central tank, we'll start dropping that crushed malt and start mixing it with hot water. Okay, the hot water that we get comes from this large tank, this large tall tank in the background that supplies us with all of our hot water for the brewing process. Hot water is called liquor. I'm not sure why, but that is a hot liquor tank or just a hot water tank. And it's supplying the central tank right here with hot water, and then we drop that grain. There's a large mixer in there that will mix that, incorporate it, make sure there aren't any clumps of malted barley. And that's where the primary reaction and on this, what we've referred to as the hot side. When most, most people think um, the work that you do in a brewery, they're actually thinking about the liquid that you're making. And so this is when that liquid or wort, W-O-R-T, wort is actually just malt sugar water, okay? And that's where this wort actually is made is in the mash tun, the central vessel. So in that central vessel, when you rest, when you mix hot water and malted barley together, anywhere between like 148 degrees, you can go a little lower, and 160 degrees, you can go a little higher, all that starch in that crushed malt will be converted to sugar, all right? And then once that is done, the entire mix will be pumped over to a different tank. And I think we're gonna take a stroll right here through the brew deck. There's a sink right here. Uh, this cylinder right here and this corresponding cylinder, we will actually take samples of wort out of the kettle with us, and this allows us to cool it down. We'll place it in here and it runs water through it. And just a little utility sink, sink that we have up there. But we're walking past the mash tun right now. On the far side is the kettle. And then we're going to get a, another view going down. The fellas are right here. They're working actually on opposite of this sink. Opposite of this sink is actually a large control panel. Everything on this brew house is uh, automated. Um, so there is, uh, there is compressed air that is opening all the different valves uh, and things like that for, for, for this entire system. We're gonna scoot past them. And this is the nice and shiny louder ton. So this is the tank that was closest to you when I first gave you that rundown shot of the brew house. What we're going to do is you can see that this has like a screen bottom right here and it has these rakes. These rakes are meant to keep the mixture that's moved over, the mass that's moved over homogenous. And then this screen down here, the, this, this mass screen is gonna help us separate the grain from the now wort. Remember we had starch, starchy malt going in and now we actually have liquid that is sweet. We have wort or malt sugar water. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to separate that out. And so we can have clear grain free work going over to the kettle, which is the third vessel in line. But a nice shiny picture of the louder ton. There's a lot of German words that are 
that are used here with, with these things. So you can see right here, we have the mash is actually being pumped over and it might be a touch hard to see, but I'm gonna pause. Actually, I'll take this back. And you can actually see a little bit how it's lighter over here because this is actually just water in the tank and it's actually the grain that's being pumped in over through here. So we're transferring the mash from the mash ton over to the louder ton where we'll, where we'll be able to start clarifying it and then moving it over to the kettle. Right here, you can see that there's water. It looks like a shower head up here is spraying down on top of the mash bed, all of this grain here, and there's, there's water on top of it. What we're doing right now is we're running what's known as the sweet wort or, or the most sugar dense wort over to the kettle. But in order to get the full volume of liquid we're going to need for our brew day, we're going to sparge, which is another, I believe, German root word or spray or sprinkle um, hot liquor tank water or hot water on top. And so I always like to give a coffee analogy. So if you think about making a pot of coffee, if you only put half your water through the coffee maker and made that really rich, dense, dark, robust, awesome coffee and separated that, and then put the other half of your water through the grounds that you've just used and separate that, you would have a really dark coffee and a really lighter, weaker coffee. This is the same thing that's happening with the first wort, the original really strong wort that you make. And then as we sparge or continue to rinse this grain bed with hot water, like you can see right here, we're rinsing lighter and lighter, uh, both less sweet wort and less flavor and aroma in that wort or that malt sugar water. But when you combine those two volumes, it makes like a normal pot of coffee, right? This is the same, this is the same concept here. So that's the sparge. We're transferring wort over to the kettle. Now, when we get to the kettle, we'll have some nice shiny pictures of the kettle here. Um, clean stainless always makes me feel good. It's always nice to see everything be shiny and everything like that. You can see in the kettle right here, and if I go a little further, okay, that's where we should stop. So the kettle has a main drain right here and a couple others. There's a spot where we can drain wort out of, and then there's this little shield right here. On the other side of that, there's another port just like this. What happens in the kettle is we'll get our full volume of wort, and we're going to boil that wort for anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. During that process, we will add hops to the beer, Hops do three important things. Sometimes people say, I don't like hoppy beer. What they're usually saying is, I don't like bitter beer. And an aversion to bitterness is very natural. Like that's not, it's not uncommon, but hops can add bitterness, flavor, and aroma. I think a lot of times people like uh, hop flavor and aroma, but they're not as crazy about the bitterness. Um, so anyways, but we will add hops to the kettle here at varying points for either just straight bitterness or to try to generate some nuance and some beer in the beer with some additional hot flavor aroma. And we space those out throughout the boil. Once the boil is done, we're going to whirlpool the tank, meaning you can actually see it right down here. I'm not sure with the screen share if you can see it, but there's a, a little a, a, there's a little side port. And, and what it actually does is it actually, here's my coffee cup. It runs in along the side of the coffee lid here. <laughs> and so it would pump around, all right? So there's a port right here. It, it wouldn't just push liquid into the center of the tank, but it pushes around the outside to actually create a whirlpool. That whirlpool is not meant to be some massive vortex or anything like that. It's meant to get the volume of the kettle moving because during the boil, different malt constituents will slam together and form particulate and they'll get heavier. So what we want to do with the whirlpool is once the once the steam or, or the heat is off the kettle, we'll whirlpool that kettle, turn that pump off and let it spin. And so that way, any uh, any like kettle debris, we call it like trube or like it's like protein and malt particulate. It'll form a cone in the center of the tank and it will leave. It'll form this cone of trube and protein right here in the center and it'll leave clean work or clear wort on the outside of the kettle for us to harvest off, okay? This is kind of the end of the hot side. We will be getting into 
now the cold side of production, which is really the most important thing. Because you could make the best wort on earth, you could have the best brew day ever had, but if things aren't appropriate on the cold side, it doesn't matter. Oh, here's right here. For some reason, I want to take a picture of my shoe. I wanted to show you this. This is our heat exchanger, and this is the beginning of the cold side. So the heat exchanger does exactly that. It will exchange the heat in the wort for the cold temperature of the water that we feed through this. These are all really fine plates that are stacked up next to each other very, very closely. And so if you take a cup of coffee and you pour it into a big dinner plate, it'll cool off much, much more quickly than it will in the cup because of surface area, right? So what we're trying to do here is with this heat exchanger, all these are thin little plates. On one side will run boiling work or near boiling work, and the plate next to it will have cold water coming in. So the hot wort will go in hot and come out cold. The cold water will go in cold and come out hot. So it exchanges that heat between the two liquids. At this point, that cold wort will be sent over to our cellar. And you're gonna see all these conical shaped fermenters here or, or these conical shaped tanks. We have two uh, size tanks. You can see 60 barrel tanks on this side meaning that we would have to turn our, or, or use our brew house twice to fill those. These, these first ones here, these first two tanks right here, FB1 and 2, they're 120 barrel tanks, so it takes us two days to fill those. Um, we then run that cooled wort into these fermenters where we have yeast that is added, and it's in these tanks where this wort is now officially beer because it's in contact with yeast. Fermentation occurs, yeast consume the sugar and, and the now, you know, malt sugar water, um, reduces that sugar, creates alcohol, flavor and aromas, um, and heat. And so all these tanks have to be temperature controlled with glycol. So that's actually a big, an, a big infrastructure part of what we have is all these tanks are, are, are glycol cooled. Um, that fermentation process uh, can take anywhere from, you know, seven to 14 days, depending on what type of beer it is. Once uh, all the sugar that is supposed to be consumed is consumed, the yeast kind of goes to sleep. Yeast is an amazing little thing. Uh, it, 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 it'll evaluate the volume of sugar that is available to it, its food source, reproduce to meet that need, consume it, and then kind of go dormant and settle to the bottom of the tank. At that point, we will cool the tank down. We'll harvest yeast off the bottom of that tank for another fermentation. And then we will move that beer to another style tank, which is called a bright tank. And these bright tanks, we have two right here. And you can see the shape of the bottom of the tank is different. These are dish bottom tanks, not cylindroconical. And in these tanks, we will finish the beer, meaning we will typically filter the beer that is going in here to remove any protein, any haze, any yeast left. So it's going in clear. The beer will be completely, uh, receive any final carbonation that it needs in this tank. And then we package out of these tanks. I think I have a shot of the filter coming up. So the filter would be in line. Yep, here's our filter. That would be in line. And then we're gonna start looking at our packaging side a little bit. So this is uh, our canning line. We have a depalletizer um, that's taking these 12 ounce cans and running them up and along. Over here, there's a twist rinse that they go through and then they are fed in to the canning line right here. Right here, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six fill heads, so this fills six cans at a time. It runs through a rinser. It's blown dry right here, and then it'll go through our labeler right here. So the beers, uh, the cans will all be labeled right here, date coded right here, and then this is the pack off station, and, and you'll see that in action a little bit. This is this depalletizer that's sliding individual sheets of cans down to the twist rinse. 
I always think I always like watching this stuff happen. I don't know why. Here's the beers being labeled. Date coded and then ready for pack off. This is our awesome keg line. Um, what we do with our kegging line is this is both a keg cleaner and a keg filler. And so these kegs will be loaded upside down on this and the connection point for the, the tank, the, the keg would, would fit in right here. This side, uh, the left side, I believe it's the left side, but this side I'm moving the, the cursor around on. Um, we will put a dirty keg up there. We will clean the exterior of the keg, uh, place that there. It'll run a full caustic cleaning cycle on it. Um, it'll be rinsed. And then something unique about our keg washer is that it is steam sterilized. We don't have to use a sanitizer. Sanitizer only kills 99.99 some percent, uh, but sterilizing actually kills everything um, uh, via the use of steam. So once that keg is cleaned, purged with CO2, sterilized, we can then slide it over to the next portion, which would actually fill directly off of the bright tank, that dish tank bottom, the, the dish bottom tank that I showed you a few moments ago. Something else that's nice that not a lot of people have, we can uh, slide this keg, that this tray actually meets the level of this conveyor belt. We can slide these kegs down here and they stop down on the end. You can't really see it, but here's the, this big blue line right here is actually a vacuum line. And this, this plate right here actually fits directly to the side of the keg and it has like, bike handlebars on it and we can vacuum that to the keg and it's actually a lift for the kegs those kegs are 160 ish pounds um and it's it's not i'm, I'm getting closer to 50 uh you, you don't want to have to be slinging those things uh, uh, around by hand so that's something really nice that we actually have um obviously it's it's a labor saver it's a back saver for for our staff and it's a safety thing as well um and so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the process um, as far as um, what we have going on there. Do I have time for a, a couple other like big picture things? Um, I'm, I'm not quite Absolutely. sure. I don't remember what my time is. Once I start going, I, I kind of <laughs> lose track of things. Well, we'll just tell people if they have questions, put them in the, th in the you know, and I'll let you know when they come through. But yeah, feel free to okay. sound on whatever you'd like. Sure. And I touched on a, a couple of things at the beginning, but there's, so first of all, when you see all of the stainless steel, um, things can look like rocket ships and, and far more fancy maybe than they really are. Now, I, I will say the brewery, the Sonder, where, where I brew right now, um, is, is, has a lot of bells and whistles that a lot of microbreweries don't have. Um, they, they're things that make, uh, that make, labor easier. Um, there are things that are good on the safety side for, uh, for the staff, um, but there's also some, some big difference makers as far as, um, as, far as quality goes. Um, that we, some, some instrumentation, some equipment that we have um, that not everybody has access to, um, especially on our size. So we, we made 6,000 barrels last year. So actually, if you see this, this keg right here, this keg right here, the, the keg most people are, that normal size keg, that's a half barrel keg. Um, and so two of those is one barrel. We made a little over 6,000 barrels uh, this year. We're looking, to, we're looking to grow in 2024. So um, not everybody has this type of equipment and, and we are pretty, pretty spoiled, pretty spoiled to have it. But you know when, when you look around and, and you see the big stainless steel tanks, um, first of all, they do look awesome. It, it is cool. Um, but, you know, on, on a very basic level, because um, sometimes people make beer at home, it's simply a vessel um, that you can ferment beer in, right? Um, for anybody that makes beer at home, um, the equipment that you're using is different, but the same things are happening. You're turning starch into sugar. Um, you're trying to be as clean and sanitary as you can. Um, and you're trying to keep an eye on like your yeast health, yeast management and things like that. So, um, yeah, 
Um, but SOPs are a very big part of what we do, our standard operating procedures. We're trying to replicate what Chase, um, my boss, uh, wants to be doing with these beers. And so you have to spend a fair amount of time on that, you know, updating uh, updating things on the educational side and, and trying to make sure that our, our training uh, materials and processes are as robust uh, as they can be. Because right now we have a total of seven people in the back that will do various brewing processes. So we have to make sure people are on the same page. Sure. There's um, a question real yeah. quick for you mm -hmm. um, from Josh. Uh, how do you quality control your beer and do you ever have bad batches? And if so, how do you find out and prevent it from getting canned? Yeah, so uh, a, a big thing is um, we we are measuring constantly. So when uh, during the brew day, where uh, some of the big metrics that we that we track are the the pH of mm. of the liquid at, at various stages, that's gonna that's gonna be a big marker. Um, we have very detailed note taking both throughout the brew day um, and then throughout the fermentation process. So. Here, we actually have a fermentation log where seven days a week, 365 days a year, uh, we track every fermentation every day. And so what we're tracking when we track that is, is how much sugar is left in solution in that fermenting beer. Um, and we're also tracking the pH of that beer. Because the, one of the interesting things that yeast will do when it comes into contact with wort is it will drop the pH right away and it'll drop it into the low fours. So it gets relatively acidic. And in part that is to create an inhospitable environment for other spoilage organisms, right? Because yeast wants to, uh, you know, uh, survive. So that's one of the first things it does. And so as a benefit to us, the fact that it's dropping that pH, and especially believe, I believe 4.5, 4.5 is kind of the, the food safe range. Um, it, it's getting us below that food safe range. Um, and so that's a, that's a, a big indicator for us. As we track through the process, we do, uh, we do sensory work as well. Um, so yes, that's tasting. There's a difference between tasting and drinking. I think sometimes there's, <laughs> there's the expectation that, uh, you know, you're just drinking all day, not necessarily the case. Um, but tracking pH is, is, is a big one. And also you, your own senses, they, they, they play, they, they play a big role. Uh, they play a big role. So if you see pH dropping and continuing to drop on a beer, it's it's a signal that something else uh, microbiologically is going on. Um, we do have a lab as well um, where we where we track things on the micro level. So yeah, we, we have those things in place to where um, to where you try to prevent that stuff uh, from happening downstream. To where you have a bad beer going into package. Thank you. And then. Uh, another question. This is probably going to be the, the last question. So after okay. this question, if you can uh, share with us how we can ourselves, where we can visit you and, sure. and partake. I want to try this hazy IPA. That's my favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, but Elizabeth asked, uh, how and where, well, how and where do you sell your product and how did, how do you build your customer base? Yeah. You know, um, so we are uh, in, we have, Pretty good coverage throughout Ohio right now and a little bit into, into Northern Kentucky. Uh, craft beer is an interesting thing because um, there is a, a, a relatively large part of our base um, are people that are craft beer fans. And so they actually like to travel for it. Um, I know a few and of those. So, yeah, yeah, right. And so I, I, think, I, I think we benefit from that. But, you know, um, big picture, um, effective marketing. Uh, helps as far as um, you know establishing a brand, uh, establishing a brand voice, um, and then ultimately, I mean, ultimately the best marketing is is word of mouth. You can tell somebody all day long, you know, what you're about on Instagram, but it's when people leave your establishment mm -hmm. with the experience that they had with your people and with your product. That's what's act. You know, that's what's really going to get people back there. I, I don't think there's any stronger. I don't think there's any stronger marketing than that. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. And, um, you know, we're at time. Um, 
but thank you so much. This is, I, this reminds me of uh, like those how it works videos or like <laughs> Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And it's so yeah. satisfying to see that. <laughs> and I'll never, I'll appreciate my, my IPA so much more now. <laughs> well, I, know. I, I do actually, if you, if you want to see more things like this, I have a YouTube channel that's called Adam makes beer. If you go to the playlist section, I have full brew days. So it, oh, it awesome. kind of is like, you're doing like a brewer for the day with me. So check out play uh, playlists. Uh, Adam makes beer on YouTube. I also do stuff on Instagram. But if you want to see like more behind the scenes stuff, how those things work, um, that stuff is out there. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam. And <clears throat> thank you everybody for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a good week, everyone. Yep, you too.